often when we think about the fall of the Berlin Wall, we focus on the geopolitical transformation that resulted, whether the unification of Germany or the collapse of the Soviet Union. In fact, 1989 affected almost every aspect of transatlantic reality. To take just one example, think about the significant changes to the urban landscapes of post-communist cities. The legacy of 89, this series, will be as diverse as this European continent itself. And we're gonna try to encompass the overall legacy and understand how those events 25 years ago continue to affect us today. In order to launch this new series, I could not be more pleased than to welcome three extraordinary individuals to discuss the unification of Germany and its impact. First, I wanna to turn to Ambassador Robert Zellick, who is currently the chairman of Goldman Sachs International Advisors. Prior to his current position, he served as the president of the World Bank Group, deputy secretary of state, US trade representative, and much more. Perhaps most importantly for tonight, Bob was the lead US negotiator in the two plus four process for Germany's unification, serving under Secretary of State James Baker. For his vital contributions to one of the most important moments in German history, Bob was awarded the Knight's Commander Cross by the German government. Beyond all of that, for us what's most important at these, that is that Bob is a loyal and long-standing friend of GMF. So Bob, thank you also for inspiring this series. Former board member. <laughs> <laughs> former board member, former fellow. And it is to Bob that I also need to give thanks for the fact that Ambassador Frank Elbe is with us tonight. Like Bob, Ambassador Elbe was at the forefront of the events in 1989, serving as chief of staff to German Foreign Minister Hans Dietrich Genscher from 1987 until 1992. In that role, he participated in the two plus four negotiations that ultimately led to German unification. He is the author of a wonderful book called A Round Table with Sharp Corners, The Diplomatic Course to German Unity. He has also served with distinction as Germany's ambassador to India, Japan, Poland, and Switzerland. It is really wonderful to be reuniting on GMF stage, this dynamic duo that did help shape the course of history. Finally, to moderate this discussion, I am delighted to have a current member of our board, David Ignatius. In addition to serving as one of our trustees, David is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for the Washington Post, where he writes a bi-weekly column on global politics, economics, and international affairs. David is also the author of several best-selling novels, and I'll make a little pitch for his latest novel, The Director. Before I hand the floor over to David, I would encourage all tweeters in the room to use hashtag legacy of 89 to discuss this event on social media. The event is on the record and will be videotaped and we'll have it up on our website. We also look very much forward to wel welcoming all of you at future events in this series. And with that, I will turn the floor over to David. Thanks to uh, Karen. Uh, I want to thank Karen for awarding me a Pulitzer Prize, but I have to be honest. The, I supervised the coverage uh, for which Carol Murphy was awarded the Pulitzer Prize deservedly in 1990, so I just don't want the record to be uh, confused. I just have the two briefest uh, opening uh, comments before turning to our, our panel. The first is that in my office, and I, I'll bet this is true with many people in this room, I have a tiny fragment of the Berlin Wall. And I look at it sometimes and I am reminded that people make history. And that's what happened 25 years ago. And the courage of the German people changed history. The second uh, starting point for me is the view, again, I'll bet many people in this room have seen this, from the US 
embassy dining room, a circular room, looking out on the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. At a dinner there not long ago, I looked out that window uh, and thought about this magnificent united Berlin and thought that the United States, which makes so many mistakes, uh, did this thing uh, supremely well, which was to keep faith with the idea that Germany would not be divided forever, that this city would not be divided forever, that uh, Soviet occupation uh, of Eastern Germany and Eastern Europe uh, was not a permanent fact of life. Uh, and I, as an American, uh, that was, it's nice to look out that window and, and think that. So I, I want to turn to two people who really made this history. As Karen said, in the famous two plus four talks, two principals, the leader of the U.S. negotiating team was Robert Zellick. And across from him was uh, Foreign Minister Genscher's Chief of Staff, Frank Alba. Uh, and they're going to take us through the history that they made. But I want to begin by asking each of you what you remember of where you were the night 25 years ago that the Berlin Wall came down, and what on that night you thought was possible, and to what extent you had in your own minds anticipated that that day might come. Bob, let me start with you. Oh, we'll start with Frank. He's All right, we'll start with Frank. Thank you. <coughs> on that day, we had just arrived in Warsaw. I was part of a delegation of Chancellor Kohl and Foreign Minister Genscher, and uh, we were having ahead of us a rather complicated uh, visit. At about uh, 7 o'clock, the correspondent of the uh, German press agency, Renate marsch Potocka, came up to me and said, we were close friends, Frank, the wall is falling. I looked at her with a certain irritation. I went up to my room. I called the uh, crisis center of the foreign office. I had a, a colleague from my crew, my vintage, I said, Peter, what's going on? He said, I don't know, I haven't heard anything. But wait a minute, I'm watching strange uh, pictures on the TV. There are people dancing on the wall. Uh, so I rushed down and uh, said, told Genscher, you know, uh, there are people dancing on the wall in uh, Berlin. He immediately informed Kohl. And in the evening, we decided to go um, uh, back to, uh, to Berlin next day. But what really uh, struck me uh, was a breakfast that we had in the morning of the next day um, between uh, Genscher and Lechow Wernser, the uh, leader of the uh, Solidarność movement, uh, in which uh, Professor Geremek, his foreign political assistant, and I participated. Um, Bauernse was appalled. He was shocked. He used a historic phrase um, that was supposed to be, have been said by Kosciuszko, one of their heroes in the uprising in the 19th century, finis Poloniae, this is the end of Poland. And immediately, Geremek stepped in, who became later on a uh, foreign minister, and said, no, 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 let you get it all wrong. This is the chance for Poland. Uh, this is the chance for Europe. At that moment, I was definitely not thinking of the uh, beginning of a process of unification, but I knew whatever it meant, we would have a difficult task ahead of us because not everybody seemed to rejoice what had happened in Berlin. Uh, Bob, do you remember that, that night, uh, that afternoon, I suppose, in Washington, uh, what went through your mind? Uh, we were talking earlier. Uh, President Bush had said in May of 1989, shocking some people, that he would love to see Germany reunified, uh, using the R word. Uh, which, which, uh, so w w what, are, what are your memories of that period, and what did you think then uh, would happen? Well, first, David, let me thank you for uh, 
doing this event with us, uh, given your vast experience, and Karen for starting what I hope will be a great uh, episode for GMF. And as I look in the audience, I just I see so many people who I worked with or were part of this, so uh, I want to express my appreciation. And most of all, to Frank, my close colleague, my older brother in this process, uh, who, uh, who really it represents in some way the, the best you can get in diplomacy with the, the sort of the trust that we uh, developed. So in an early sort of uh, foreshadowing of the pivot, uh, I was at a lunch for the Philippine president. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, people who know at the State Department, the eighth floor was uh, where they have these grand luncheons, and so the Secretary of State hosted one, many tables. And so given the time difference, uh, six hours behind, we, uh, somebody gave Secretary Baker a note and uh, that the wall had been opened or some such, and so then we kind of retreated into his office uh, after the Philippine delegation left. But what I want to emphasize about kind of the thought at that moment, just because um, you know, one of the challenges of understanding history is that when it works out, people kind of put a benign gloss over it all. But just as Frank suggested uh, with his experience, um, while one could not help but share the excitement of the people in Berlin, what rushed through my mind is, 1953 in Berlin, you know, 1956 in Hungary, 1968 in Prague. And what was you know, a very sharp recollection, I, I had been with President Bush and Secretary Baker in China in February of that year, and then you had Tiananmen Square. You know, so uh, what history has now showed was an accidental event. We had you know, no sense of kind of you know, how this would un unravel. And, and indeed, if you just start to think about the dangers that some Stasi agent may decide that you know uh, he's feeling threatened and somebody gets shot, or somebody that sort of mob an East German policeman. I mean, so the or Soviet soldier. The the possibilities, and and Frank knows this. The Soviets were totally shocked by this and quite anxious about it. I mean, uh, I saw something that J.D. Bindenagel, who was in the embassy at that time, wrote where that very month, then Fallon, who was the uh, head of the International Department of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, is sent by Gorbachev. And his recommendation in November of uh, 89 is close the border, take a million troops if necessary, we must stop this. Okay, so so we, were, we were off on a series of events that was um, highly uncertain, but you mentioned the May event, and I wanna give one other aspect of this because you know, part of these incidents are always, can you draw any lesson? And I guess one that I draw from this experience was, even though you can't predict events, you can anticipate trends and position. And I think one aspect of the history that has been underappreciated in the writing is that I remember talking with President-elect Bush in late 88, Secretary, it was going to be Secretary Baker in that period, and there was already a sense that because of the Gorbachev phenomenon, um, and because of the stirrings in sort of Central and Eastern Europe, that the geopolitical center of gravity that had been represented in the Reagan-Gorbachev relationship with nuclear arms and books about Reykjavik and doing away with nuclear weapons, this was gonna shift. And Germany, in Clausewitzian terms, would be the Schwerpunkt. Now one of the leftover items of this, of the INF, that people now forget, was we still had the short-range missiles. And this was a very contentious issue in Germany as one German officials said, the shorter the missiles, the deader the Germans. And so <laughs> NATO had a program to modernize that short range missiles. It was very politically difficult. And so I think Bush, to his credit, launches something that I saw in a lot of studies, again, pe people don't even recognize this, was that in May he brings this very bold uh, conventional forces initiative proposal to sort of lower and equalize levels which had the side benefit of basically taking the SNF issue off the table because if you achieve that level, you really didn't sort of need the short range forces. It also had the benefit of sort of establishing Bush as a clear leader in the alliance. The process, we developed some very good personal relations working with the Germans on it. Before, right before he left, B Bush makes this statement which reflected internal discussions, David, at that time. And Bush is, you know, I was very much of the view going back earlier that reunification was something in the wind. You had no idea though, you know, when or how it could occur. And Bush makes this statement, sort of welcoming it and saying that Germany had reached a point and 
I think he said done penance for his sins and you should let a guy up in very normal human terms. Um, you also had the speech that he gives uh, after the, U the, the NATO summit um, in Mainz, mm -hmm. Chancellor Kohl's, uh, the capital of his home state, rhineland pfalz where he talks about partners and leadership. He goes to Poland and Hungary. That's an important dimension, as Frank mentioned, in that while Germany is the sort of exciting, dramatic example, all of this had to take place in the context of larger changes in Europe. <coughs> and so I think, I think President Bush 41 actually deserves some significant credit for positioning so that when these events take place, we were, we were better positioned. Another small one that Frank will remember, the U.S. Secretary of State since 1968 had not met with uh, the, Czech fo the Czechoslovakian foreign minister. During that September, you had this dramatic event where the East Germans had been trying to get out to Hungary. They were stopped. They were all in the, East, the, West, the West German embassy in Prague. And uh, uh, Foreign Minister Genscher and Frank work out this arrangement where they are able to come to the West by traveling by sealed train through East Germany. And as an effort to try to make this deal happen, uh, Hans Dietrich Genscher asked Baker, he said, will you see the Czech foreign minister at the UN meeting to sort of show that you know, there's something in it for him? And you know, as you would imagine, we had people that say, oh no, you should never do this. This would acknowledge these terrible guys. And Baker quite practically thinks, well, if Genscher asks for this and I can help him, I'm gonna do this favor. And this is part of the, the sort of the oiling the gears of diplomacy that's quite significant. Frank, in your uh, wonderful book that I've been reading, you, you have this dramatic uh, moment in which Genscher is in Prague at the German embassy looking at this crowd of Germans who are tr wanting to, 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 to flee and, and says to them, fellow citizens, I have come today to inform you that, that your journey into the Federal Republic of Germany is imminent. And you have a sense from that moment that this is moving forward. Just to continue our story, uh, at the end of November, uh, Chancellor Kohl announces his 10-point plan for reunification. And I, I'd like to ask you about the run-up to that, and then I'd like to ask you about the repercussions, because that created consternation in uh, Paris and London both. Uh, the, the French felt they hadn't been consulted about the 10-point plan. Thatcher famously said uh, uh, that uh, Germany was pursuing narrow nationalistic goals. So uh, take us back to the, this uh, announcement by Cole of the 10-point plan going for it and, and uh, what uh, your, your government, what you and Genscher did to try to deal with uh, anxiety elsewhere in Europe. Let me start by referring to something which Bob has just mentioned about the uh, meeting between Baker and Genscher in, in Prague. It was a little bit different, but it will please you even more. Um, we had that day negotiated with Shivat Natsa, and Shivat Natsa had agreed. The Soviet foreign minister. The Soviet foreign minister, that, uh, that he would send a telegram to Moscow because the situation in the embassy in Prague had become unbearable. Uh, Genscher was very, very nervous, and uh, we had an invitation to uh, the residence of the French um, ambassador to the United Nations, uh, where he met with Dumas. Dumas, at that uh, moment, was the president of the European community as they said it in those days. And French foreign minister. <laughs> and French foreign minister. So um, Genscher uh, felt the need to report to him uh, what had been achieved and asked him for his assistance. And you know, uh, Baker was standing uh, next to uh, the two ministers and uh, he interfered immediately by saying, and what can I do? And Genscher was enormously relieved uh, to get this offer from the uh, United uh, States uh, Secretary. Uh, so you can live with this twist, I think. <laughs> um, Tell us about, about, about dealing with, with Paris and London. Pardon? Tell us about, about, about 
dealing with your, your European partners, the, the French and the British in particular, yes, in I, this I'm coming period. Up to, yeah. You know, um, uh, we were never really um, unsure what the French uh, position was. Um, we knew that Mitterrand was an intellectual uh, who could think in very clear categories, had reassured us again and again that he could not imagine a united Europe without a united Germany. Of course, he had not in mind to do it tomorrow. But in the general philosophy of the Prime Minister of France was the Germans should have their unity if the time is uh, mature. There was a misunderstanding on uh, the day when Kohl announced the 10-point uh, plan, uh, which turned out to have a dramatic impact on the personal relationship between Helmut Kohl and uh, Francois Mitterrand. What had happened? Being the, uh, the president of the, United, uh, of the European community, Mitterrand had invited the heads and states to a dinner uh, to Paris, wishing to discuss the situation in Berlin and around Berlin. And here they sat all together. And Kohl didn't mention one word that he was about to uh, announce the 10-point plan three days later in the federal parliament. As we know, meanwhile, from the notes of Horst Telchik, who was his security advisor, he had suggested to keep this as a top secret, namely because of his fears that the liberals might jump at this project and profit from it more than the union would do. Uh, anyway, the <laughs> the uh, all French, politics is local. The French, <laughs> the the French. I will come back to it. <laughs> the French foreign, uh, the French um, president was appalled and furious and enraged. And of course, uh, he was also a vain man, and he didn't like to be treated like this. And I can understand his position. And he made uh, two speeches, one in Kiev and one in, East, in Dresden, um, which threw some doubts about, uh, upon the French position. However, I must tell you, the moment when Kohl and Mitterrand had settled this issue, uh, the, the French were very loyal to the whole uh, process of negotiation. Uh, of course, they wanted to have a little special role. They um, assumed the position of representing the interests of, the, of Poland uh, in the negotiations as far as they related uh, to the recognition of the western border of Poland. With the British, it was different. I, I believe that Margaret Thatcher, deep in her heart, had no interest to see Germany united. She felt much more comfortable with uh, an ununited Germany, perhaps because she also anticipated that the role of Germany might change after unification, in particular with regard to the relationship with, with Russia. Uh, she uh, somehow had occupied um, a special relationship in dealing with Gorbachev at that juncture. And I think she felt a little bit threatened uh, by the perspective that she would lose some sort of importance. On the other hand, it was remarkable to see that uh, Douglas Hurd from the Foreign Office uh, was a most loyal uh, friend of this cause. And once he had discussed the issues with Jim Baker in February um, 1990, before Baker went uh, to Moscow to talk to Gorbachev, uh, he, he uh, he and the Foreign Office were extremely helpful, but uh, there was um, the rivalry between the Prime Minister's Office and the Foreign Office went as far uh, as, I 
think, five years ago, when to clear the issue, um, the uh, Foreign Office opened the archives to let people know how differently they had been thinking about uh, German unification and how much they differed from the position of Donald Trump. Mm. That's fascinating. Uh, Bob, I want you to pick up this story of the, of the two plus four talks as they were perceived in, in Washington and shaped. But I want to quickly ask you to go back to something you said uh, initially, which uh, fascinated me. You said that on the night the wall came down, uh, you, you didn't know what would happen next. You didn't know if, if the uh, Soviets would uh, send troops, you know, uh, by the hundreds of thousands, whatever, uh, to try to shore up their ally. Did you talk seriously about what the U.S. would do in the event that the Soviets did react as they had in Hungary, as they had in other moments when their empire was threatened? I don't remember, uh, us, I mean, there may very well have been such discussions. I don't remember that because it didn't seem imminent at that point. Uh, what we were more worried about, because when the Soviets didn't react at first, and again, remember, this was one of the benefits of the contact, by November, Baker had already been starting to develop a relationship with Shevardnadze. We had him out to Jackson Hole. We had a long discussion. They were building a set of trust. We discussed some of the economic changes. And I do recall that there were uh, phone calls and connections uh, with Shevardnadze where the Soviets were uh, reflecting their uh, anxiety, their uncertainty of what was going to happen. I'm sure this was happening with the German side, too. Uh, but at least on their part, not uh, a precipitous action to close it down. There was more the concern about accidents and miscommunications. Let's get a little fuzzy here, but I recall that always when I got the debriefs or the calls with either Shevardnadze or Gorbachev, it always seemed that their information networks were a little rougher and cruder. They weren't quite following the pace of things to the same degree. But uh, just to give you one other example of, about going back to uh, Kohl and Genscher coming to Berlin, and Frank may correct me on this, but I think under the four power rights, they had to get clearance from the United States. I think they might have even come in on a U.S. plane. We came in on a U.S. Yeah, plane. So, so one of the things we had to decide that night was that is Cole wants to go to Berlin. Can he go? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> decide, yes. Okay. Um, but I, on, on the German and French point, let me add two other uh, dimensions, one a little anecdotal, one factual. <clears throat> I, I, I agree with what Frank said about uh, President Mitterrand. But there is a point, maybe because he was a little miffed, where you see this in the records, and it's in the Soviet archives, and also in some of the French, where there was a meeting between uh, Mitterrand and Gorbachev. And Mitterrand is testing the waters in the way that Mitterrand would do about whether there might be an agreement with the Soviets to kind of either stop this, slow it down, do something. Um, <clears throat> and of course, Mitterrand says Margaret Thatcher would obviously go along with this too. And it's quite interesting. What you see in Gorbachev's response is that he feels he's being set up. He's worried that they're going to make him to be uh, the bad guy. And you can also see, and this shows the importance of the diplomacy, he's thinking, do I want to line up with France and Britain, or do I want to line up with Germany and the US? And he says, I think it's better to line up with Germany and the US. Um, the other part about, uh, about Margaret Thatcher on this is very intriguing. It goes back to this, this NATO summit um, and this SNF issue. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was fully committed to the modernization of the short-range nuclear forces. She didn't want to change the doctrine. By the way, this is a very important point. People often say, you know, when the Cold War ends. Uh, remember, Margaret Thatcher had a very positive view about the relationship with Gorbachev. She thought she was going to, as did President Reagan, change the relationship with the Soviet leader. And so some people talk, well, this means it's the end of the Cold War because it's the end of the tension. But that doesn't necessarily mean in their mind that the cause of the start of the Cold War, the division of Europe ends. That wasn't necessarily the way they were thinking about it. So there's this wonderful incident where we, there's a negotiation on the NATO communique. And uh, during the afternoon session, I was the US representative. I think Pelchik was the German representative. We're trying to come up with communique language in a way that people do. And I was felt very fortunate because my main objective was we could have negotiations on short-range missiles, but it couldn't go to zero. So there were, partial was the key word here. 
And I remember the bracketed language uh, had about three different formulations, any one that would have worked from my perspective. But as the negotiations were going on at my level, the British representative was the NATO ambassador who had been uh, uh, the private secretary for uh, Margaret Thatcher. This is, uh, I think Alexander was his name, was before uh, Charles Polk. And he kept taking all these very tough positions, tough positions, a little obnoxious in my view. It worked out fine from my point of view because I could keep the temper of the room okay without necessarily having to be the tough guy. So then it comes down to the, the evening session. And at this time, Jeffrey Howe was still the foreign minister. And Howe, the way it works at NATO, he was, UK was sitting next to the United States. And during the course of the night as it goes on, um, Alexander keeps running up to Howe and kind of whistling his ear, and Howe keeps taking positions that, I don't know, seem to be obstreperous. And Baker keeps agreeing with him. And I'm getting more and more frustrated as the night goes on because, you know, as I at one point said to Secretary Baker, I said, Mr. Secretary, why are you taking these positions? You know, no, we don't have to agree with all those. And then he looks at me, and it's funny, this only happened a few times. He said, he said, sometime very late tonight or early tomorrow morning, my friend George Bush is going to have to decide who's running the alliance, him or her. Mm. And at that point, I want him to be able to say, Margaret, Jim stood with Jeffrey every step of the way. We now have to make a decision. I decide this. And I thought, geez, you know, I'm working at this level of negotiation. He's working at this level. And to give you a little color of this, there's a point where the negotiation stops. And Genscher's not certain what Baker's doing because Baker's taking these difficult positions. Baker and Genscher walk up to each other. You might have been there. I was there. And you can tell Genscher is a little, little suspicious. And then Baker says to Genscher, he said, Hans Dietrich, I think we have to help Jeffrey. I think he's in a tough position. And, and then Genscher says, oh, yeah, that terrible woman. <laughs> but it's quite clear at that point that you could also see his eyes light up that he realizes that Baker's playing a multi-level game here and that this is not, Baker's not his problem and that Baker's got a plan to work out the problem. We never discussed this, Dieter, but I could also give you my story about it. Um, I, I saw how the uh, temperature in the room was sinking. And uh, there was a moment when Genscher got up and he went to a certain direction in the restroom. I got up and chased behind him and I stopped him before I could enter. And I said, you know what? They are setting us up. And he looked at me and he said, nobody is setting me up. <laughs> and he slammed the door. <laughs> I was standing there rather confused and uh, even a little bit insulted because I felt I had done him a favor. So I returned to the, uh, to the, uh, to the session room and a couple of minutes later, he opened the door. Boom. Here he comes, like a German tank, you know. He heads immediately for <laughs> Jim Baker. And uh, that is That's when they have their exchange. Yeah. <laughs> and then you must, you must imagine it was a round room with no corner. And they asked for a break. And um, the Dutch chairman, Vandenbroek, granted this uh, break. He was not happy because he was more on the side of the, uh, the Brexit at this juncture. And Genscher and uh, Baker started talking. They talked against the wall. Everybody was watching them, including uh, the number of uh, waiters that was increasing, uh, <laughs> participating in a moment of which they thought uh, this is world history. Um, Vandenberg was displeased, and he said, uh, can we start again? Hans Dietrich, are you ready? And Hans Dietrich even didn't bother to, uh, to, uh, to turn around. He, he simply talked against the wall. No, Mr. Chairman, I'm not. And the two continued to um, uh, the, their talk. And what was interesting, at the end of this session, Jeffrey Howell accepted the suggestion as it had been discussed at referendum, um, and it would have been the uh, task of Mrs. Thatcher next day either to accept it or to object it. So in a way, we solved the situation but, without... But notice he then says Doug Hurd becomes the foreign minister. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey Howe's last, last session. <laughs> And, and he did it deliberately. I mean, there's no doubt about it, as he told us later. You know, 
uh, there, there was a conflict between uh, Howe and, and, and Thatcher. There was a conflict between the city uh, of London, which Howe, uh, which Howe represented, and Thatcher. Many reasons have, must have led to this decision to accept. But, but one thing, to come back to Frank's point, there's this initial period where it's unsettled. And again, to give President Bush some extra credit here, he sets up special bilaterals, because I went to both of them. They were actually, they were both in the Caribbean. We sort of split. And so one was on one of the French islands, and one was on, uh, I think it was in Bermuda. And, and, and I actually was the note taker for the session with, uh, I think, Mitterrand. And, and Bush was wonderful, because basically he let them talk. And, and part of the skill was, they, they had to express their view, they had to vent. <coughs> and to bring this back to the two plus four point, the key point in this, again, now it seems obvious, you have the Germanys and the four powers, but people were struggling. Should it involve all the CSEE? What about the NATO partners, so on and so forth? So the two plus four idea was something that, I think probably the US and German side came together about the same time to realize, look, you know, we need the two Germanys, then we need the four powers, we don't wanna make this that much bigger. I think the, the thing that was interesting was that we consciously designed it to have the two before the four, emphasizing Germany's in the lead, this is to be the unification, the four powers are supposed to be eventually ending their rights from Potsdam. Um, you, you still see people use, I think the Brits talked about four plus two, they no, wanted to put the four. Four plus zero. And, and then, <laughs> and, and the French said the six, and the kind of, and so uh, it, was a, it, was, it was to symbolize something, and in fact from a mistake we'd made earlier, which was the Soviets had been very anxious. This was talking about managing the Soviets early on. They wanted a meeting of the four powers. And so I remember we were sort of grudgingly agreed to a meeting of the four ambassadors in Berlin, and they had this terrible photo afterwards of the four ambassadors, which sent a message to the German public of, ah, the four powers are gonna stop this. And just to, the, part of the other part of this story is again, where it started with the Berlin Wall is the East German people. It, one of the reasons I think the two plus four announcement was very important coming in February was you had the elections in March. And again, to all of us in this room, it would seem obvious, okay, this is kind of on its way. But if you, I remember thinking, if you're an East German and you lived under the DDR and before that you lived under a Nazi regime, could you perhaps think, well, are we really gonna get the vote? Is this really gonna happen? And I think the two plus four announcement was a very important part of public diplomacy in saying to the East, this is moving, the four powers are agreeing, you can go vote for what you want to vote for. Just to, to ask each of you a, a final question about this moment in which, in which uh, the, the history was, was made. Was it always clear to, to, to Baker from, from the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall, was it always clear to, 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 to Genscher that it was possible to go all the way uh, to, to go all the way to unification. You had uh, allies with some anxiety, especially Mrs. Thatcher. But as I remember that period, um, the, uh, what now seems inevitable, the sort of, as you said, Bob, the historical inevitability, at the time wasn't inevitable or obvious. But Frank, was, were, were, were Genscher and Cole convinced it was doable from early on? Well, you know, I have to go back to the year 1970 when we uh, concluded in the um, frame of Ostpolitik a couple of um, treaties with the Russians, with East Berlin, with Prague and Poland. To make sure that this policy was not deviating uh, from the Western positions and to make sure that the Russians should know that we were still determined not to give up determination. The so-called letter on German unity was phrased in such a way. It, this policy with Russia is not in contradiction to the Germans aiming to achieve a state of peace in Europe which allows the German people to establish their unity. So, this has become our philosophy from the 70s. And it was a very contested philosophy which almost brought uh, um, the chancellor down in um, the vote of uh, uh, non-confidence in May 72. 
but from that moment on, we believed that the priority had to be changed, that the establishment of a piece of Europe was the first goal, and we would be happy with a spill-off, so, so, so to speak. Now, if you are educated in this framework, you have a long breath, and if the wall comes down, you realize that at least there will be some more movement now in the, um, uh, in the case of German unification. You don't really dare to expect that we would get there, not in that moment, and not even in the months to follow. But we knew whatever we would get would be better than what we had got before. So um, we, we, have, we went into this process um, with our heart beating, I can tell you that, but also we were relaxed about it because uh, we had no other choice. You didn't seem so relaxed at the time. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, the, um, the American point of view, of course, is much more pragmatic and less conceptual. Uh, so uh, that, that is the difference <laughs> between the two of us. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, and. and uh, this, you cover a lot of diplomatic processes, and then this is an interesting insight. You know, sometimes, and this is true in the Middle East of all processes, you always have to have an eye on kind of what forces action, what, what moves it beyond endless discussion that compels a decision. This is true in the trade world I work. You often had to try to figure out, sometimes you almost create these events. And this goes back to the East German people and another anecdote, uh, which is within about a month of the wall, Coming, uh, opening up. Uh, Baker comes to Berlin. He gives a speech, by the way, where, he, where he's putting unification in the context of broader changes in EU and NATO and others, because we're always trying to deal with the uh, architectural uh, issues. But we go to, uh, to Potsdam, and we did this. This was, a, this was a sort of last minute decision, because there were people who said, no, no, you don't want to give any legitimacy to the East German government. We only saw the government, Modro. We didn't see the party leader. Um, but we felt it was important, given all the chaos, to show that there was a committed process that the U.S. was behind if they had the free elections and held the process together. But as part of this, we thought it was important to visit the dissidents. So we go to, to uh, Nikolai Kirtra, a Lutheran church in Potsdam, and we visit some of these very courageous Lutheran pastors, some of the lay people. And I remember very much being struck by this because uh, I was raised as a Lutheran in Illinois and I'm in this Lutheran church and I've seen the catechisms, all these different things that reminded me of a totally different experience in a different world many years ago. And then um, as I listen to the, the ministers, I'm realizing that within a month of the wall opening, they're already feeling like the race of time has passed them by because they want to create Judith of Vague, a third way between communism and, and capitalism. But when we asked them, what, are the, what do your parishioners want? What do the East Germans want? They said, they want what they see on the West German TV. You know, they want to be like their West German cousins. And it was a way of crystallizing something that, frankly, our reporting from our Berlin and East Germany, very good people, but they were more with these intellectuals and reflecting that. And what we could see on the ground was there was a momentum. And this had a couple of implications. One, it had an implication that this was going to be a takeover by the West, not a merger with the East, which had the implication of using Article 23 of the Basic Law, which has been done for Tsarland, because the West Germany was the only legitimate state. But it also had an implication that these people were going to continue to be a force in the diplomacy. If the process stalled, you'd have a mass migration, or you might have riots, who knows? That's important as we create the 2 plus 4 process about the idea of kind of pushing action because there are a whole series of issues along the way that are difficult issues, and the Soviets were always a, kind of a step behind in this. The biggest one was a united Germany and NATO. So we lived in constant anxiety that the Soviets would say, okay, united Germany, that's fine, but you know, not in NATO, okay? And we didn't know for sure what the German position would be. As it turned out, they did try to delink those, and Genscher and Kohl held with the, the NATO position. But take about this one. What if somebody in the Soviet Union had been smart enough to say, okay, NATO, but the French don't belong to the military alliance. 
they can't belong to the military alliance, okay? That would have been a very difficult problem to deal with because it would have fundamentally gutted what we thought was a strategic importance, not just for Germany and the United States, but remember, for the Poles, for others in Western Europe who were sort of anxious about these issues. So I think part of the story throughout the process, which runs to the very last night in Moscow when there's an uncertain issue about what will be the role of non-German NATO forces uh, in the Eastern Lender, and so how will that be handled? And eventually that was handled with a footnote leaving it to the West German discretion, and this is important because I, I remember at the moment, this is given some of the subsequent controversy, interesting to note, thinking, look, at some day Poland may wanna come into NATO and you may wanna have the ability for US forces to cross Eastern Germany to go into Poland, okay? And so I didn't, I wasn't gonna put that on the table and say, oh, by the way, I'd like this to move so we can bring Poland into NATO, uh, but, that was certainly in the back of mind in the process. But the key point here was, it was the East German people that constantly forced action. And from the US position, there's one other element. I said Germany was important, and we thought it was not only important for the moment, we thought it would be important for the future. So we had this view that, you know, over time, Germany would be the most significant country in Europe. And therefore, it was very important not to single out Germany for special treatment. We kept talking about this phrase about not singularizing Germany. And what that meant was that when we got rid of the four power rights, we wanted to get rid of all of them. And frankly, this is again one of the longer term perspectives. We thought, you know, who knows? You might have a subsequent generation of Germans that says, why are we being treated differently? Why are we being suffered discrimination? And so what, what is interesting about this story, and we haven't talked about this as much with the Soviet Union, but we made efforts with the Soviets as well, was we were trying to avoid a Versailles victory. We are trying to avoid some, an achievement that kind of planted the seeds of its own destruction. And so, and this was I think also the, the German conceptual view of what, as Frank said, is doing this within a European construction or transatlantic construction. And frankly, we tried to create opportunities for the Soviet Union in this process as well, there was an incident about this coming up with nine points where we sort of tried to present the same that we would take care of their interests as well if they were a reasonable set of interests. Well, that's I, uh, Frank. I, I do not quite agree on the uh, singularization issue and I'm happy to mention it here because it's the only uh, issue that has divided us throughout the so, uh, whole process of negotiations. Uh, of course, we didn't want to be singularized and uh, Genscher, uh, deviated from a code of uh, all, all animals are uh, uh, equal, but one animal is more, uh, but some animals are more equal than others. Now he said uh, that in the case of Germany would mean that all animals are equal, but one is unequal. Uh, so we were very much in sympathy with your uh, singularization issue, and we supported it uh, right from the beginning. The crux of the matter on that evening was that we felt that the British uh, tried to, to blow the process. This is the last yeah. night. That is the last <laughs> night, you know, by insisting that they could, should hold military exercises uh, in the um, uh, GDR. That was totally untenable. And I remember in that night, after the pyjama conference that we had in your hotel, um, the pajama the conference. It wasn't with me, it was with Baker, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I never dressed informally. Uh, you <laughs> <laughs> well, you with the plural. You know? <laughs> I think one of those times Baker taken a sleeping pill and Genscher got upset about something and had to wake him up with a sleeping pill. <laughs> but the real point of this story is, is that the, the U.S. <laughs> plays a mediating role. <laughs> and yes, indeed, you, you, you helped us uh, to uh, achieve a solution which, in fact, uh, was um, very important and very much in line with the singularization issue because if we were to become full sovereign, you get full to sovereign, we, are, we are going to decide it. That was uh, what made the thing that the British were um, um, totally um, mispresenting this, this case. In the night at three o'clock, the, um, uh, the then Prime Minister of the GDR, Lothar de Maizière, woke me up and uh, said, I hear that the British want to have military exercises in the GDR if the uh, unification should fail. And I returned to Berlin, and he said it in his broad, beautiful Berlin dialect, nobody will believe him. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to ask one more question from here, and then I want to turn to the audience. So please be thinking of the questions that, that you want to ask. And, and 
I, I want to take up uh, Bob's reference to uh, a Versailles-like piece. And I want to ask you to reflect on the view that Putin, the Russian president, uh, expresses uh, often and obviously is deeply motivated by, which is a sense that this period when the wall came down and after that we're celebrating was part of the humiliation of Russia and that it generated deep feelings in Russians of his generation and most obviously in Putin himself that we're having to deal with to this very day. So I want to ask you, Frank, and then, and then Bob, to speak about whether there were mistakes in this period and, and immediately after that, had they not been made, might not have led to this sense uh, on the part of Russia uh, of having it, uh, its, its guts torn out. I don't think we made any mistakes. All participants in the process were of the same view that at the end of this, as an outcome of the process, we would have a changed security environment. And uh, we took the uh, security interests of the Soviet Union at that juncture very seriously. And even after the, uh, the um, conclusion of uh, the treaty, we were acted accordingly. For example, this is something which we did uh, together. Uh, we made a draft of the uh, so-called uh, uh, Warsaw uh, Pact NATO liaison concept, uh, allowing for uh, closer cooperation in security issues. And when the, um, uh, the Warsaw Pact collapsed, the ink hadn't dried on the concept yet, uh, we actually um, uh, drafted a a concept for NEXI, the North Atlantic uh, Cooperation uh, Council. So everyone was um, acting in a spirit that we had really achieved a breakthrough. Uh, and a breakthrough it was, you have to take into account that there were sensitivities, not only among those functionaries who didn't like the idea of uh, unification, like Farin, like Potogolov, <laughs> like Konyenko, but there were also sentiments in the, uh, in the Russian public. How could you explain uh, to uh, the Russian people that their sacrifice in World War II had been in vain? Uh, that all of a sudden they should not only uh, accept to give up the status quo as it has been um, triggered out, uh, as it had worked out in Potsdam, that they sh would not only that, that, that Germany should become united and that, uh, thirdly, Germany should become a member of NATO. These were very, very touchy uh, issues. And I think everyone at that moment took the se security interests of um, the Soviet Union uh, seriously. Now, the idea of humiliation came up later. Uh, first, everything went relatively well. I mean, there was some enthusiasm which was perhaps um, unjustified. Remember, you remember the book written by Francis Fukuyama about the end of history. Uh, now, we never thought that we had achieved the end of history, but uh, to use uh, a, a saying of Bert Brecht, we have done the difficulties of the mountains, now we have the difficulties of the plain ahead of us. This was our thinking. We, we were prepared for a more organic uh, process of uh, coordinating our relationship. But we, had, we were all convinced that we would uh, be uh, dealing with a different security environment. Things started to get a little bit missing, messy with the idea of establishing a um, anti-missile uh, uh, system, which had, as the Russians said, the quality of uh, an ABM system. 
they became a little bit messy during the uh, uh, Jordan crisis. But then there was a moment of a deep relief, and we were there in Munich in February 2009, when Pre Vice President Biden announced that the uh, United States of America would change their relationship with Russia by abandoning the idea of having this uh, missile umbrella and by pushing the reset button in their relation with, with Russia. In the room, everyone was, you know, relaxed. You know, it, it, it was uh, almost a new start. I don't know what has happened in between the announcement um, of Biden in February 2009 and the, the, the present uh, situation that we have now, um, which brings us back actually in a way to the identical situation that we had during the Georgian crisis. But I can understand the frustrations um, of Putin. Uh, and if he speaks of humiliation, he may not feel humiliated himself, but you have also to see that he has a domestic um, uh, a front at home. They are the old communists, they are parts of the forces, they are the new uh, nationalists, they are the oligarchs. And um, domestic problems is not a privilege of the West. It has become uh, a problem of uh, 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 Russia as well. And then you have a century old division since Peter the Great between the so-called Sapatnikis, the Westerners, and the Slavophiles, uh, the conservatives, that has not stopped to exist since the fall of the wall. Now you have a man here who I think is committed to cooperate with the West, who all of a sudden finds an environment in which it is very difficult to do so. So don't uh, judge him so much by the language when he talks about humiliation although I can understand a certain bitterness on the part of the Russians. So what, what do you think? Yeah, well, let's, let's, it, it's important to understand the diplomacy uh, because part of this was, this was moving so fast for the Soviets, and in their terms, the correlation of forces had turned against them, that we, we were partly trying to help them come up with explanations at home, which was an important yeah. lesson, by the way, for negotiations. Sometimes in a very fast-moving situation, your counterpart may be fuzzy about how to achieve his or her objectives, may even be not certain of his or her objectives. I mentioned these nine points earlier. There was a point where I was sitting with Dennis Ross and we were saying, you know, I'm not sure the Soviets fully grasp the things that we've already suggested. And I listed these nine things and, you know, so what we actually did is we packaged them. I made a presentation, Baker made a presentation of these items that you know, are noted with specificity of things to deal with it, which influenced Shevardnadze and, and Gorbachev. But to give you a really interesting example, part of the changes was the changes in NATO. And so um, the United States was pretty aggressive with NATO communiques in those days, which people here in this audience knows are often drafted out of Brussels. We were doing drafts and bringing them to people, which is a rather uh, sort of forward uh, approach. Again. But, <laughs> but one of the things was that Baker meets Shevardnadze before the NATO ministerial in Scotland at Fernbury and goes over with Shevardnadze, he said, these are the things that we hope to get in the NATO communique, I can't be certain that we will, so on and so forth, and I want you to be aware of them to show our good faith. Shevardnadze thanks him profusely because he says, if you're able to get these, I will come out promptly and endorse them and frankly get ahead of some of those that are sort of being the, the resistors in it. And so you have an era where the level of trust between a US and Soviet foreign minister is so close that before the NATO allies have agreed on something. Baker's sort of presenting them to the Soviets as possibilities so that the Soviets can use them to embrace the process. And then, of course, it did require some tough diplomacy in Turnberry. This is where the nuclear doc doctrine of flexible response was changed to no first use and so on and so forth, an issue that was a tough uh, issue for, uh, for Margaret Thatcher again. And so there were a number of steps made with the Soviets during that period. But where I may differ a little bit from Frank on this is, is that you know, at the end of the day, you can only do so much. They have to make the decision. So, I mean, I continue to believe 
that there was and there would be an opportunity for Russia to have a very constructive relationship with the European Union, with NATO, the United States, but for various reasons, and I think you know, there's an accumulation of this. There's Kosovo, there's other sort of, there's aspects that, that for one reason or another, Putin feels that um, he's been taken advantage of. I personally believe that he, while he was prepared to go into Crimea, I don't think he was planning to go into Crimea. I think the events in Ukraine seem to be running away from him, and he felt, once again, that things are being taken advantage of. And so this is part of the problem, a little bit of the mindset that is created. Now, how much of this is the fact that you know, he's a KGB colonel? Frankly, what he saw was- He was a president of the KGB. Uh, and so, so the point of this is, is that you know, he has a different approach than some others. So you know, I think uh, this is, again, as, as Frank says, it's important to understand the mindset of the person that you're dealing with, even if you don't agree with it. In this case, I, I just I think he's taken Russia in a in a very difficult and I think unfortunate direction for Russia over time. But that's we'll see what history, the future history brings. So I, I do want to turn to the audience uh, for your uh, questions. Uh, if you could uh, raise your hands, identify yourselves, keep the questions short. We'll get as many as we can. Who would like to? Uh, yes, this gentleman. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for a fascinating discussion. Uh, Dieter Detke, Georgetown University. My question is this. How was it possible that talk about a real chance of unification started so much earlier here in the United States than in Germany? Uh, you mentioned, uh, David, um, uh, President Bush talking about this in May. I remember a meeting with uh, Vernon Walters, who was just about to go to Bonn at the time. Um, and, and I accompanied Mayor Momper of Berlin to that meeting. And Vernon Walters told us, yeah, unification is going to come. And Momper fell almost off a chair. And uh, how can you, uh, Bob, explain why the United States had earlier indications than Germany? And Frank, maybe uh, talk about the German side if you can. Thank you. OK. Um, I'll give you an anecdote that I think um, at least explains some of this. Uh, very early in 89, I think it must have been February, uh, Baker agreed to see uh, Defense Minister Stoltenberg, who he normally wouldn't have seen. He was the defense minister, but they had been colleagues as finance ministers. And I remember um, going to the room where the meeting was going to take place a little early, and there were some German officers standing in the back of the room, and we were making conversation. And at that time, we referred to it as reunification, uh, later using unification because of the 37 borders issue. And uh, I remember asking, saying, you know, what's the discussion in Germany about reunification? And these officers were tentative, but they were starting to explain, you know, possibility, mood. My own answer, but be interesting to hear from Frank, was I think Germans had a combination of not wanting to seem provocative. Remember, when Cole comes out with the 10 points, that's seen as a very explosive thing. Remember, we saw um, uh, sort of um, Gorbachev in December in Malta, and Gorbachev was not so keen about what he thought was the German push for reunification. This is in December. So if Germans had been making this point earlier, I think it would have been seen as very provocative. And then also maybe there is a sense of, you know, you have to, as Frank was saying, there's space and time and so on and so forth. In the United States, frankly, we didn't have the same sense of historical hangups. And so to come back to this, this incident that I mentioned, as I'm having the discussion, some of you may remember Roz Ridgway, who was the Assistant Secretary for Europe under George Shultz, had served in East Berlin. And she said, what are you talking about? And we said reunification. And she said, oh, the subject that all Americans are interested in but no German cares about. Okay. Now, frankly, I was only 35 years old at this time. This was a senior American diplomat. And I thought that was an extremely undiplomatic thing to say because what the heck do you think the German officer is going to say? Do you think he's going to say, oh, I'm sorry, I disagree with you, Madam Secretary. I really want to push unification. You know, so uh, it was, this is an interesting lesson, by the way. When the Cold War ended, you could see that the view in 88 was reduce tensions, new relationships, not necessarily end the division of Europe. So Bush comes in with a very different concept about trying to achieve this. And the only other thing I can say from the American side is you're, it goes to this anticipation. You're seeing the forces. And again, it wasn't just Germany. It was Poland. It was Hungary. And basically, the common sense 
non-Gazamt concept view was, if the East Germans ever had a chance, they're gonna want something very different. And so that's where the wall becomes important. The opening of the wall and the fact that the Soviets and the East German regime do not stop it creates a momentum and then we're off. The other aspects I think important historians will look at is how the East German regime itself starts to decay and come apart. And this is partly the Gorbachev visit, him basically giving Honecker the cold shoulder. You know, you start to see a regime that for all its terribleness and all its cruelness and all its authority is kind of rotting out and, and people aren't quite sure where to take it. And that's where the people of Berlin and their courage on November 9th took events in their own hands and we were fortunate. Frank? Well, you know, uh, I know the book of uh, Walter Braun. Uh, I never heard him say so before unification. But it is often the case that if something goes well, the, a, lot, uh, a lot of um, people claim the fatherhood of uh, developments. Um, would we have said that in such a way um, earlier? I don't think we would because we were in a different situation. I lived in Bonn. The Russian, the, the Soviet tanks could have been in Bonn within six hours on the run. Uh, we were in the reach of uh, short range nuclear weapons and later on, of course, the SS-20 would have been targeted upon the capital. Um, at the same time, we had uh, concerns uh, to safeguard what had developed as a small part of a cooperation and um, uh, in, 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 in trade, but also in human relations. After all, they were our brothers on the other side. Um, of uh, the Iron Curtain. We were not allowed to be playful about it. And we also came from uh, a different point of departure. We had for many, many years maintained the so-called Hallstein Doctrine, which said that we would, the only, we, we were the only one who would uh, be allowed to represent uh, the GDR uh, legally. That, that uh, doctrine hasn't brought us very far. And uh, I don't know, you, you, I know you don't appreciate my conceptual uh, uh, <laughs> approaches, but let easy. me just for a moment be what I am, let me be a German. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you see, the breakthrough actually came with the Amel report of 1967 when NATO decided that it is the highest goal of the alliance uh, to establish a lasting and just peace, order of peace in Europe. And then um, spelled out two different ways how to get there, namely sufficient, um, uh, sufficient military security and not or and a policy of detente cooperation and um, confidence building. We had the feeling that since 67, things were moving to the right direction. Not only got we our house in order with the Poles, with the Czechs, with the East Germans, and with Russians, we were successful in concluding the um, uh, final act of Helsinki, which actually was something which excited the Poles. I was during that time as a junior officer in Warsaw, and I felt um, how enthusiastic they had become to read the text of the final act. We had gone a long way and we were successful. We believed that at the end of an organic proce process, we would get closer together even if we would have only got the options in 1989 to establish a relationship as it existed at that time between West Germany and Austria, we would have rejoiced about it. Mm. I would remind you that at the party convention of the Christian Democratic Party in August 1989, a junior member of parliament suggested to abandon the article on unification from the Constitution, 
not because he did not believe in unification, but because he felt that if we take it out, it would be a signal that we had no bad intention in dealing with the GDR, and the price we would get then was a better relationship. By the way, that was Volker Rühe. It caused an uproar uh, in, uh, in Bremen at that time. And uh, it is, but it is bad to say that he was wrong at that time simply because we got unification a year later. Yeah, this is, this is a very, two important points. One is, looking back on these events, it, it gives one a sense about understanding history written about other periods. Inevitably, when you see what happened, it distorts your view of what people were thinking at the day. I think there was somebody shot in February 89 uh, trying to cross uh, yes. the border. So this gives you a sense what we're talking about from a German perspective about the fear of, of, of losing this. One other point though, we talked about the German public. Uh, it has to have, be a word of thanks here to the American public. Going back to some of the things that you cover now, David, you know, sometimes you see the United States gets in trouble around the world because Americans think that everybody else thinks like we do. And sometimes they don't necessarily think like we do. But at this point in time, it made our diplomacy much, much easier that the American public generous sense was, you know, of course Germans would want to unify in dem democracy and freedom, and you were here at the time, so you know kind of that sense. And to be fair to the, the Brits and the French and others, I remember getting hate mail because I was identified in the Times of London about sort of leading this pro-German group. And, you know, uh, this very poignant letter from a woman who'd lost her father in World War I, her husband in World War II, and, you know, the emotions of this were still very deep for people. And fortunately, in that case, the U.S. public was kind of all supportive. Although, interestingly, some elite opinion was not. If you go back and you look at some of the major newspapers at that time, a little more cautious. Yes, the gentleman uh, here. Uh, I am Yaroslav Martinuk, uh, formerly with Radio Liberty. And uh, my question is, Having the benefit oh, of 25 it? years of hi hindsight, which situation is more dangerous, 1989 or the current conflict with Putin over Ukraine? Mm, interesting. Uh, Frank. I, I will tell you what is more dangerous. The, um, the current conflict over the Ukraine and the policy leading to it, but, but perhaps not in the... Uh, sense you may expect it. Let me go uh, to the Cuban crisis. Never in the history we have been so close to a nuclear war as we were in Cuba in 1962. And it is just accidental that these, this crisis, uh, that this nuclear exchange did not take place. What was the lesson? What was the lesson of this? She, um, Khrushchev and Kennedy recognized the need for communication, for confidence building measure. The first thing that they did, they established a hotline. So they could co communicate in the beginning of a crisis. The next step that they did was the test bed. And so it went on. It was, there were arms control agreements, there were disarmament agreements, there were the Helsinki process, Germany bought the house in order with its Euro Eastern European neighbors. And what had actually happened was that we had an architecture of confidence building. Now, we still have a, nucle a, a niche of the Cold War, even in spite of the fact that the Berlin Wall came down because both superpowers are legally in possession of 1,600 warheads, each of them. The uh, doctrine of mutually assured destruction, abbreviated MAD, is that who shoots first dies second. This doctrine builds on the belief that uh, uh, this, this 
is built on the, the uh, expectation that all parties will act rationally. So it comes to a question of the distance between the button that triggers of the nuclear war and the thumb that presses it. The beautiful development after Cuba was that we have packed a big mattress of confidence building measures, agreements on cooperations, etc., between the button and the thumb. If we are now running the risk that we are dismantling these layers of confidence building by simply singling out Russia as we do right now, the likelihood that the, the, the distance between the button and the thumb will diminish is very, very high. Therefore, I see this, pre uh, president, uh, this present situation <coughs> more complicated as any situation uh, before, except for the Cuban crisis. And we cannot calculate upon a, a Russia that is as accurately guided, and it is indeed, by Putin. I would not like to, uh, to imagine what the situation in Russia will be like if uh, um, Putin is replaced by any of his followers. It will be a decrease of our security, definitely. So what my advice is, don't do anything by, um, by bringing closer the button and the thumb try to develop on the successful uh, philosophy that we had enshrined <coughs> in the Amel report, that we also have, that we are striving for a just and lasting order of peace in Europe, that we also have to take security accounts of Russia into account. And let us widen this gap between the thumb and the button. Bob. I'd love to know your reaction, both to what Frank said and to the question. Well, it, it, it's so hard to compare because in one, we, we saw how it turned out, and one is still in flux. And um, I start by thinking that, you know, this is again where the hindsight has 2020 vision. All I can suggest is that, you know, for all of us who grew up in the Cold War, that was, was a very dangerous and scary experience. So when people say, oh, it was simpler then, I adamantly disagree. Going back, I remember as a, a nine-year-old in the 62 crisis going to bed and thinking I wasn't going to wake up in the morning. I mean, I haven't had that happen to me. So, uh, so except when I travel too much and I get jet lagged. <laughs> uh, uh, so so uh, I think one other, though, key distinction with hindsight is that Gorbachev and Shevardnadze and others had a very different view of what they wanted for the Soviet Union than, unfortunately, than Putin had. And so, you know, we... It didn't just stop with, with Germany. I remember that I switched roles a little bit with Bob Kimmett with, when the Balts were uh, sort of reasserting their independence. And we, I was sort of the action officer back in Washington because other people were working on the first Gulf War. So dealing with the, the potential killings in, in Lithuania and others, you know, would blood be shed and would that start to unravel? And so it turned out, you know, to our good fortune that uh, Gorbachev and Shevardnadze didn't want that. But I don't think it, it partly reflects who they were as people, but it partly reflects that they were trying to change the Soviet Union and they wanted the West, a relationship with the West in doing that. As it turned out, I mean, Gorbachev, I think, unleashed forces he had no idea that he, you know, was going to unleash. And so this sort of ran away from him. With Putin now, who I've also first met, I think, in 91 or 92 when he was a deputy mayor in uh, Leningrad, I think you have a different situation. And in that sense, I think his view of himself and his Russia and for whatever reason, kind of the relationship is uh, more troublesome now. On the other hand, I don't expect it to break out into sort of nuclear conflict. And I think the challenge now is frankly, uh, trying to uh, make clear that there are certain violations of norms that we came to hope were accepted in the end of the Cold War, such as invading territories, uh, that, that that is not acceptable to other countries. On the other hand, as 
Frank said, I think part of the challenge here is Ukraine has always needed to have a relationship with both Europe and Russia. I mean, it's just, and, and you know, you can't escape the geography of that. So personally, I believe that uh, that will be negotiated. And I think the difference of view with some is that uh, when you look at what Henry Kissinger writes about this, okay, Henry Kissinger is still in the concert of Europe model. He kind of thinks that the certain powers can negotiate this. You can't negotiate this for the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians have, this has to be their future. And now we're in a question of kind of balancing the strength of the Ukrainians economically, politically, and others with what Putin will achieve. And it'll be messy and it'll be unfortunate, uh, but I don't think it'll lead to nuclear war. The, however, I also, coming back to listening to Frank, this is, it's, a, it's kind of a lesson for diplomacy in this sense, in that what you see, and obviously I, I was just in Berlin earlier this week, so it's not that I'm unfamiliar with Germany. What I heard in Frank was something that is what I'll call a, at least a certain German or European concern about where Russia could go that could be really bad. And, and you don't get that as much in the United States. And it's important, whether it's right or wrong, to understand that perspective. So at, in Berlin earlier this week, I was with somebody, Wolfgang Schäuble, and I explained how it affected the diplomacy of German unification. It was the Polish border issue. Kohl had a different view than Genscher about being clear on the Polish border. Whether we agreed with it or not, it was partly his politics, it's partly his sense, it's what he could clarify to the polls. The fact that we understood it allowed President Bush to frankly do uh, kind of an informal mediation and reassurance to the Polish Prime Minister about that the border would be resolved. So part of this is a lesson is about kind of the nature of diplomacy of trying to get in the minds and understand the perspective because it may not change your view, it may change how you approach it or you may uh, change kind of the combination you could deal with. And part of the story of German unification, which you get a little bit of a sense here is that, you know, we, we didn't always agree 100%, but by understanding the perspective, he understood what I was bringing back from, from uh, Baker or Bush and from me understanding the German perspective, a little bit the history of this, you could kind of work around what, what otherwise could be frictions or even breakdowns in a way that allowed you to move forward. It's a very important part of diplomacy, whether trade or security or other issues. So let me take a last question, forgive me, in the third row here, the, yes, please. Roger George, National War College. Uh, we've talked about well, all to the- To be fair, Roger George was on my negotiating team, <laughs> uh, so he was, Roger was, uh, was from the intelligence agencies, the best relationship we ever had. It's the thing I learned about intelligence since this is a field of expertise for you, which is, is that, uh, frankly, uh, I will never know what goes on or all the resources. So you get a very good person, you make him part of your team, and then he'll bring in the information from wherever they get it. Well, I, I, I wanted to see if we could complete the circle with the two plus four. We've talked about every party except the East Germans. And after the election, that to, they suddenly became part of the negotiations. And I recall you had at least one meeting with the East German delegation. Um, how do you deal with the East Germans when they're not really a pull-up player? And I'd be interested in Frank Elvin's view dealing with the East Germans. Since this is an inner German issue, let's start with the inner Germans. This is the two before the four. <laughs> and I'll, then I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I compliment it. Well, I think um, Kohl was not very happy when he produced the formula of uh, the flourishing uh, countryside, blühende Landschaft. Uh, did, did you mean the diplomacy or afterwards? Diplomacy. He wants to know the diplomacy. Well, we, we are having no, no, dip, no diplomatic relations now with them, but uh, <laughs> okay. No, that, uh, that was a tricky subject. Oh. Um, Unfortunately, I think Mr. Meckel, the foreign minister, um, came under strong influence of some of his West German leftist disciples. If he would have had to deal with the East Germans only, it, I think certain things would have been uh, more s smooth. But uh, there were some uh, absolutely unacceptable ideas um, such as a denutralized uh, neutralized zone. 
and a nuclear weapons-free zone, Germany, the United Germany being a buffer, nuclear-free buffer, uh, between the Western Europe and the Eastern Europe. Uh, a lot of romanticism got into these negotiations, not so much from the East Germans, um, not so much from Messer or uh, Meckel or Misselwitz, uh, but I must say, unfortunately, from East German romantics, um, from the Otto Suhr Institute in, in West Germany. It, it came to a point where it was grotesque. And um, what do you do? Uh, we didn't wish to single them out. We didn't wish to ignore them. But eventually, we stopped taking them very seriously. And um, then there was a change of government. The coalition um, government between uh, CDU and uh, SPD came to an end. And then things uh, became uh, normal and, and, and regular again. Um, and um, de Maizière uh, became, who was the prime minister, was also foreign minister then. And we could negotiate uh, well with them. But the idea, I remember when they came out with a zone that um, um, the Czech Republic and the uh, Czechoslovakian Republic and Poland and Germany should form a zone of security. And that was Meckel. He asked Genscher what he thought about it because he felt that he had to you know, make a contribution that did not look like something that had been dictated from the West. Genscher said, it is an interesting idea. Have you already consulted with the Poles or the Czech? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Meckel felt encouraged to do so. And that was the end of uh, the story. Um, <laughs> but um, except for these things, they uh, did not. They, I don't know what your impression was. I felt you're getting they, away here. They, 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 <laughs> I felt they were not part of the process. It's a very interesting, that's why I wanted him to go first. Uh, because, um, and just for people to have the context here, this is kind of the might have been. Remember, most of us, are, the, the conventional wisdom was in the elections, the SPD, which had more historical strength, would be the winner. And so, Cole, you know, really makes the big push, in a sense, to campaign for the CDU, which by and large had sort of had sort of less legitimacy, less organization, so on and so forth. So Damien de Maizière, which Frank refers to, is the CDU prime minister, but they form a coalition, and Meckel is the SPD foreign minister. That's why we've got this sort of combination. So the first point is that those elections really matter. The second is that uh, I remember being almost a little bemused by this because it's part of why it was an extraordinary period, not only in Eastern Germany, but you know I remember the first visit with Havel, you know, or in Poland. These revolutions pushed up a group of people that you would never see and will never see again operate in that sort of that, that realm. And there was a poignancy, there was a, a, a there was a intellectual power to it, there was a decency, but particularly for the East German negotiating team. You know, obviously, I, I watched uh, Frank and Dieter Kestrup and you know, Genscher and others, the highly professional, trained, experienced people. They were tearing their hair out with these guys, you know, because they basically were kind of intellectualizing about this dream or that dream. But then I actually used to try to say, you know, take a little easy. That's what, <laughs> you, know, you have to understand where they're coming from a little bit. It'll work out. We'll get them where they need to be. Um, and, but it was, it was a moment where, you know, as Frank gave a wonderful example, they would be experimenting with, remember, these, these were people who, in a way, this is where it's a wonderful conflict. If they weren't dreamers, would they have gone and become theologians and stood against this terrible regime, okay? So the fact that they had a willingness to stand out, be different, be courage, think their own views, 
these are tremendous qualities that help make this possible. But when it came time to the details of diplomatic negotiation, it was a little bit uh, frustrating for the West Germans and complex for the rest of us. As, as Frank <laughs> said, you know, and again, but this, this is think of their experience. The things that they're putting out, the Poles would tear their hair out, the Czechs would tear their hair out with. There were points where, where the East Germans would put out things that the Soviets would kind of scratch their head and kind of like, you know, look, we're on this other path. We got to work this out. Where the <laughs> heck is this coming from, you know? And so, because the Soviet diplomats below Shevardnadze were by and large a tough, cynical group, you know, yes, they were sort of caught in this instant. process. So, in that sense, uh, when I was in Berlin, I actually met one of them, a retired pastor again just this week. And so, there, there are people that have a, a sort of an inner strength and sort of kindness and decency you have to respect, but it also shows how this, in different environments, uh, wouldn't necessarily fit the order of the day. Now, uh, since we've said a few things about the British, I have to close with one sort of other anecdote to show that the British deserve fair treatment in this, which is when it came time, <laughs> and you, you may remember this, is that when it came time for the drafting, obviously we had to do the final settlement agreement in the four official languages, German, English, French, and Russian. And there were two of us that claimed to speak English, uh, the Americans and the British. British kind of only suffered that we might have some competence in the language. So we gave them the, the toughest parts. And the toughest parts, obviously, if you're uniting Germany, again, is let's get the borders right, right? So and we said to the Brits, you, you do the section on the borders. And if you go look at the drafting of the final settlement, one of the ways in which the new United Germany is defined is to have its composite parts. So we'll have the Federal Republic of Germany, the German Democratic Republic, and Greater Berlin, the old four power uh, unit. So you can imagine my surprise when I got the drafted English version from my British colleagues and it said, the new United Germany will consist of the Federal Republic of Germany, fine, German Democratic, fine, and Greater Britain. So, <laughs> so d despite what Frank says, the Brits were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. For <laughs> this was going back to the royal family. I mean, it was and I kept that page, and when I presented it to my our British colleague, uh, the political director, John, do you remember John? Uh, Sir John Weston. Sir John Weston. He didn't quite see the humor in it. But I <laughs> so, uh, as your moderator, I can't remember a richer uh, discussion in Washington than this. Uh, you know, on behalf of GMF, um, uh, uh, I'm going to I'm going to close this, and Len will. We'll, talk with. Uh, I thank you, uh, Bob and Frank, uh, for coming here, for sharing the history. Absolutely riveting. Um, if you want more, read Frank's book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.